Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're delighted that you're joining us today for the latest in our series of policy spotlight discussions. Today, we will be having a conversation with Lois Pace, Director of the Office of Global Affairs in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Now, the majority of health affairs content is focused on the United States, but we consistently publish high quality policy relevant papers on a broad range of global health topics. One recent paper, for example, examined the relationship between democratic governance and the protection of universal health care during economic downturns. Another paper took a global look at levels of trust in healthcare workers and governments and how that trust relates to attitudes towards vaccination. Fully a quarter of our online readers are outside the United States and our publisher is Project Hope, a global health and humanitarian relief organization committed to transforming lives and uplifting communities by empowering healthcare workers. So we have a lot of global in our work in addition to our domestic policy focus. Now, Policy Spotlight is a series of virtual events that we launched this spring featuring in-depth conversations with influential health policy experts. We featured CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks Lashur, CMS Innovation Director Liz Fowler, National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at HHS Nikki Tripathi. We are recording this event and the video will be posted on this page within a couple of days. When you registered, we asked if you had questions for our speaker and there is a chat box below the screen if you're watching live. We'll do our best to weave those questions into our conversation. But now it's really my pleasure to get the conversation going. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce Lois Pace, Director of the Office of Global Affairs at HHS. Reporting directly to the HHS Secretary, Ms. Pace is the Office of Global Affairs lead on setting priorities and policies that promote American public health agencies and interests worldwide. Before coming to HHS, Lois served as President and Executive Director of Global Health Council. Earlier, she held leadership positions in global policy and strategy partnerships at Livestrong Foundation and the American Cancer Society. She's worked with Physicians for Human Rights and Catholic Relief Services, and she was a member of the Biden-Harris Transition COVID-19 Advisory Board. Now, I'm gonna try not to hold it against you as a Cal grad, but you do have a bachelor's degree with honors from Stanford University in Human Biology. Uh, you also have your master's degree in International Health and Human Rights with the distinction of Delta Omega from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Lois speaks several languages, including Spanish and some French and Japanese, and has lived in Africa, Asia, and Europe. We had the pleasure back in 2015 of publishing Lois as co-author of a study, The Global Health Movement Needs the Voices of Those Affected by NCDs, along with Parvi Bhatt. Uh, Ms. Pace, it's so a pleasure to have you with me today. It's really great to be here, Alan. Thank you. Um, so I wanna make a lot of room in this conversation for you to talk about the Biden agenda, but I think we ought to start with topics that I know are top of mind to anyone who's watching this program. In September, you attended the Global COVID Summit hosted by the White House. More than 200 governments, international organizations, leaders from various sectors, private, philanthropic, and civil society participated. We're almost a month out. Tell us where we are. What are the actions? What are the commitments coming out of that summit? Yeah, that was a really exciting time to bring the world together. And I applaud the president for um, hosting uh, the summit. I think we got a lot of really great feedback from our international partners as well. Uh, it's not to say that um, people had not mobilized previously. And in fact, we acknowledge uh, how much had been done um, before that moment to try and rally the world, and yet we saw it as an important time to, uh, to sort of reset uh, our collective agenda. And so, as you said, you know, you had a lot of government leaders, uh, civil society representatives, uh, industry, uh, and philanthropic uh, attendees really coming together to say, okay, we know we have come a long way when it comes to fighting this pandemic globally, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, and so there were a few pillars that um, we sort of structured the event around. Uh, we obviously were very focused on our efforts to continue vaccination efforts around the world and not just talking about what the U.S. had been doing, but what we all could and should be doing. And so you had some additional 
commitments coming out in that regard, which we can get into and we're, we're quite exciting. But importantly, we wanted to bring to the front of the conversation other issues beyond vaccines alone, right? So you talk about vaccines, but you also have to talk about readiness and uh, the ability for countries to receive and absorb these products uh, so that they can actually become shots in arms. And so that was another important piece of the conversation. And we didn't want to forget if and until we can reach everyone around the world with vaccines, we have to meanwhile be thinking about tests and treatments and supplies, right? Let's not forget that PPE is still very important for folks in the front lines. And so that was another uh, pillar of commitments that we heard. And then finally, um, just how we not only respond to the current crisis, but prepare for the next one was a, a really crucial part of the conversation. And so I was uh, had the pleasure of moderating a panel with our vice president where she announced the, the US's commitment uh, to launching a sort of uh, international fund uh, that would be focused on global health security and pandemics, but invited others to uh, sort of make their own commitments, financial commitments towards this effort as well. So that's where we, that's where we were just a couple of weeks ago. We were looking forward to reconvening um, these stakeholders in sort of smaller settings as part of a series of conversations over the next three to six months. But we want to be making more progress uh, towards closing this gap. So I want to uh, continue this thread. Uh, you did a great job of talking about the contents of the discussion. I guess I want to push a little bit more on the outcomes. So you, you mentioned four or five areas where it was really important to discuss and focus attention. Now, what comes out of that? What, what comes next? Not just yeah, so, uh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. I was gonna say not just the follow-up meetings, but the, the actions, like you mentioned the fund, you mentioned mm -hmm. readiness, uh, uh, distribution. I'm just curious if you can tell us a little more about the action steps. As well. Yeah, of course. Look, well, let's start there. Um, one important, that's a really important piece, um, this idea of how, what we are trying to establish. Um, the idea is to stand up something that could live at a place like the World Bank, um, we've seen similar types of initiatives of efforts or efforts before, but what would be slightly different about this, aside from it focusing on global health security or health emergencies, is also that it would allow for not only governmental funding, but, uh, but non-governmental funding, right? And so we are in conversations now with some of those very actors who could house this facility. And beyond that, um, there's also a complementary effort working with the G20 countries to think about, okay, well, who can or should be directing those dollars? Uh, and so those conversations are ongoing um, with regards to sort of, um, I guess, the structure around that type of fund, because the fund itself, you know, isn't sort of all we're about. We have to be thinking about the governance model. Uh, and so that's something that HHS has been involved in with the Department of Treasury really tracking, okay, well, what does it look like to complement um, these dollars with that type of um, governance or, or strategic direction? And then finally, um, there was a recommendation that came out of um, the many reviews over this past year as to how we can do all this better um, to have more of a, I guess, a higher level political oversight um, of all of this. And so that's a little bit more TBD, um, how that um, sort of sits over both of those, I suppose, uh, pillars or, or work streams. Um, but that is kind of the three-legged stool we're looking towards when it comes to, to funding the pandemic um, or any future emergency. Um, when we think about um, vaccines, obviously what comes next for us as the US government is continuing to roll our own surplus out the door, but um, the president made a commitment to purchase an additional 500 million doses of Pfizer. Uh, and so that would follow on the commitments that we've made already. I mean, we've already gotten close to 200 million vaccines out to 100 countries, right? Um, but we're continuing to pump, push those out um, to countries around the world through the COVAX facility. And then we'll be adding on this 500 million uh, starting next year. So that's that's a work in progress as well. Um, we also so continue- just, uh, bef mm -hmm. Before you keep going. So yeah, of here. course. 700 million is is a lot. And mm -hmm. in the world, it's still nowhere near enough. I think yeah. everyone knows that. So without in any way taking away from the incredible meaning of those numbers, what comes after that to close the gap? 
Yeah, I mean, so you're right. A billion, the billion that the U.S. is committed to sharing is not going to cover the world. And so one of the other things we're doing is we're working to, frankly, push other countries to fulfill their own commitments. There's already been two billion that's been committed by countries, but the U.S. seems to be um, making progress in ways that perhaps other, other countries have not yet made progress. And so that was also the point of the summit is to push um, those countries to uh, sort of establish or, or sort of start rolling their own products off of shelves. Um, so that's that's an important point coming out of this, in addition to adding to those commitments. Um, and that involves not just countries, but companies, ensuring that we can scale up production of vaccine so that it's not just on us to vaccinate the world, but really on all of us who are able to provide that support. Thank you, that's helpful. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, Fine. Let me uh, let, let's keep going with some of these other dimensions. I mean, I think it's it's terrific talking about the capacity to move the shots into arms and the broader capacity for the future. I guess what I feel like we hear a lot of is that COVID is actually uh, taking away from capacity in other areas. I mean, mm -hmm. not surprisingly, you have a, an emergency. You have huge economic and human loss associated with it. And uh, we do have a long history in global health of sort of program by program, silo by silo, disease by disease. So if the goal is to have a robust uh, infrastructure to address this and the next, how do we make sure that the support we're giving now is building that foundation, restoring the losses that have occurred through this pandemic so that we're not I mean, we always say this after every time, you know, we're, we don't want to go through this again. Right. How, how do we do it a little different this time? Well, that work has started, which is good. I mean, we have to give credit to these existing health initiatives that have been able to stand up in the wake of this pandemic and, and fight COVID in addition to what they were doing already. Um, you're right. A lot is at risk. And we've seen uh, some areas really suffer under the weight of COVID. Um, we've also seen uh, initiatives rise to the occasion. And so you look at PEPFAR, for example, or even extend that to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And you have these examples of existing nurses and clinicians and other community health workers being able to pivot in an important way um, to find people who are at risk, to help with vaccination efforts, to help with testing or just community education. Um, and so that's one way that we're leveraging what we are doing. Now, how do we protect it or you know, build on those programs? I think it's by investing in those very existing institutions and initiatives as well. So we're not just trying to build new um, sort of funds or, uh, or, or uh, bring in new health workers, which is absolutely critical, but we're also trying to shore up of the foundation of these other programs that I mentioned. And so one example of that is the president's commitment to, to funding the Global Fund and our uh, additional contribution to the Global Fund of $3.5 billion, because we recognize how it's pivoting to meet the moment. That's very helpful. I, I want to broaden this out to some of the more uh, uh, general uh, issues around the World Health Organization. But before we do that, mm -hmm. I, again, I feel like I sort of cut you off and I want to make sure if there's more on the follow on to the summit that you want to say, you get that opportunity. It's fine, Alan. I can go okay. on. I, <laughs> okay. no, you can great. cut me off anytime you need to. Okay. Um, well, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked about that, though, because the summit also tried to touch on this issue that you flagged, which is critically important. There's a, a lot that um, has or runs a risk of falling by the wayside. Uh, if we aren't careful. I mean, the, the world of global health isn't COVID alone. That's our reality. And so one thing we talked about uh, during that particular session in that event, and one thing we continue to contemplate uh, as a government is how we can um, sort of beware of those aftershocks or ripple effects and address those. Another important, or one important area of that is around um, maternal and child health. Um, and in particular, women we find are at great risk in this pandemic. Um, their health needs are not being met entirely. Um, and they are also at risk for other issues like gender-based violence and the like. And 
And that's tragic because the U.S. has made some pretty important um, investments and commitments um, in that space. And, and more importantly, um, these women um, are not getting the, the care and services that they need in this moment. And so uh, as we talk about you know, saving the world from COVID, we have to think about these you know, uh, special populations or historically marginalized groups so they don't fall farther behind. Even general childhood immunizations are an issue too, right? I mean, just <laughs> making sure we're still able to fight measles and polio and, you know, these other issues that our CDC and others are, have been doing very well. But again, it's been harder um, to do that good work because of the pandemic. So a big part of that infrastructure is the World Health Organization. And uh, it's had some challenges, I think it's fair to say. Um, there's the report from the Independent Commission uh, that looked at the severity of the COVID outbreak and identified various deficiencies. Um, there are issues of, of, of trust. And I just wonder if you can tell us how the administration responds to the commission report, uh, what kind of reforms are top of mind? Yeah, WHO is a critical partner in all of this. And what you heard the president saying at the beginning of our administration is, look, we are committed to international cooperation. We are engaging and re-engaging with the World Health Organization. And so HHS as the lead agency um, for that relationship has really um, wanted to fulfill that commitment. And what's been helpful about re-engaging is that we've been able to then be at the table to have these sometimes difficult conversations with WHO and its leadership about how they evolve. Um, we've been co-chairing this uh, member state working group in recent months. What, that's looking specifically at how WHO responds to global health emergencies, taking all of these different recommendations that have come out of these reports that you referenced and trying to understand how to categorize them and what uh, and how to prioritize them, frankly. Um, and that falls into sort of a few different areas, but suffice to say, like you said, we didn't get it right the first time. Um, and that doesn't solely fall on a WHO. WHO is made up of countries like the US, right? Who also have to um, sort of do our part. Um, but it's been important for us to, to be a part of those conversations so that we can collectively examine um, what, what went right, what went wrong, and how we can all be better. Um, so before we go a little deeper in that, I just sort of have to ask the question that mm -hmm. I'm sure is on folks' minds, which is uh, the prior administration said, we're out of here. And you said, we need to be here. What are the lasting implications of that dramatic a shift in US government policy with respect to uh, international relations in general, uh, and certainly the WHO specifically? Well, it's been interesting the way we had to come back to the table and how we have been received by some countries, which, you know, you can imagine they're, they're wondering, okay, are you, <laughs> you're back, you're back for good. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're excited, uh, I think, to have us at the table. They know how important and influential the U.S. is as part of the, these conversations. And for our part, we're trying to come in good faith, of course, um, and with good ideas, right? Um, with um, ideas for how to move us forward. And, and so I, I, it's been good um, to, to be back. I think the, the longer term implications are that, um, you know, we should be aware of, our, of that power or influence that we wield and, and, and use it in the best way that we can. So that's what we're trying to do by being a part of these conversations, by having, um, uh, real um, discussions with, with WHO at a leadership level, but also at a regional level um, in, in various parts of the world to understand their needs better and, and how the US can best support them. Do you feel that some of the criticism of how WHO responded to the early days of the pandemic have affected other countries' willingness to follow their guidance? You know, I wonder about that. There are a lot of countries, I mean, all, all of its member states are, are still at the table and, and wanting to strengthen WHO. Um, we might have different approaches to how that should happen, um, but for the most part, um, people are, are really looking to ensure we um, 
build on what is arguably a, a strong foundation um, and, you know, not only look at, at global health emergencies, because that's not everything that WHO does, um, but also look at its other pillars of work uh, across the global health spectrum. And you mentioned sort of bringing together different reports and analyses. Mm -hmm. Are there one or two priorities for changes at WHO that stand out as where you really want to push? Yes. Um, you know, there, well, there, there are a couple of areas in particular. There's one thread uh, that's really focused on sort of governance and accountability. And that's looking at WHO um, to a degree, but more broadly looking at what we call the international health regulations, what really, the, they're really sort of considered a tool that's used to alert the world when it comes to any global health emergency, right? And ensure that we're all taking action in the way that, that we should. Uh, and so that's been a major focus um, of ours is looking specifically at this existing mechanism um, because there are tweaks that we could make um, to, to improve that system instead of sort of building a new um, way for the, for the world, including WHO, to be responsive. Um, I think we also can't um, ignore the fact that to do this work well requires resources. Um, so whether we're standing up a fund or looking more closely at, at how WHO is resourced, um, that's another important part of the conversations we have been having is this idea of sustainable financing for institutions um, like WHO. Um, so, because I think we can do ourselves a disservice if we are setting the bar higher and, and not having um, that be matched um, with, with funding. Um, uh, but the, another key piece um, that maybe isn't talked about as much is this idea of, okay, if we can improve accountability, right? And if we can um, sort of uh, make, uh, if not increase resources, then make our use of those or WHO's use of those more efficient, how do we ensure a level of access and equity that we also saw play out um, and have and continue to see play out throughout the pandemic response? So how um, are these sort of various regulations being applied uniformly across the board, across all countries? How do we ensure um, that people all over the world have access to various innovations, right? Um, and life-saving products or services. Um, that, Equity and access piece is obviously important to HHS and, and, and this administration broadly, um, but is an important question that I think people around this table at WHO are also asking. Well, I, I keep wanting to hand the mic over to you and say, talk about your priorities, but that last mm -hmm. comment just cries out for me to bring in yet another topic since you brought <laughs> up equity. And that's uh, climate change. And mm. the fact that's very clear that the health effects of climate change are distributed highly inequitably. The costs associated or the disruption associated uh, with reducing the emissions that are a primary cause of that are concentrated in higher income uh, countries. Um, how do we talk about equity and health uh, around issues of climate in addition to issues of COVID or financing mm -hmm. of the World Health Organization? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked about that. Uh, you probably are aware, as is your audience, that HHS recently established this Office of, of Climate and Health Equity. And so we're seeing that, that synergy um, and, and recognize the importance uh, of, of bringing all of these threads together. Uh, I can't say much about, about um, sort of what we've been able to, to do to date because it's a very recent office, but you know, our, our ideal is doing just that, like you said, pulling, pulling those threads together. Um, I, you know, and it is one of our priorities, um, you know, since you, I know you said you want to ask me about that at some point, but it's not, it's not necessarily off topic. In terms of how we address it, um, you know, it's new, I 
think it's fair to say, for uh, health actors, including in the global space, to see these connections, let alone work towards them. So at baseline, um, we have to start by acknowledging, right? Um, and really sort of describing or identifying where we see these intersections play out. I think with a pandemic um, such as this one, we could you know, speak to the importance of One Health and planetary health. And I think more broadly, when we talk about global health security, I mean, we see it with Ebola outbreaks, which are still ongoing as well. Um, this, you know, and the importance of really focusing on, on One Health uh, a, a, as a discipline. Um, it also is going to take, though, um, us working beyond institutions like WHO, which recognizes the intersection of climate and health, but you know, there are other uh, multilateral institutions that focus on this area as well or have a sort of a different take on it. Um, so it's sort of stretching ourselves um, beyond the usual suspects, I would say, in the health space um, to really consider uh, that as um, kind of the future, right? Um, we, we can no longer sort of be as siloed uh, in the work that we do. Uh, and that includes within the U.S. government, too, which is why this new office we have at HHS is so exciting. Um, also acknowledging the work of the State Department um, and other parts of government who are also kind of looking at that sort of alignment. So that's such an important point. And I'm going to resist bringing in yet another topic, which I will mm -hmm. in a minute. But I just want to stay with this theme of uh, One Health and the complexity of issues that have tremendous effect on health that aren't maybe the traditional health topics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here we're talking about cl uh, climate change. So is WHO prepared institutionally to address topics outside of the traditional health domains? Uh, you know, you mentioned the need to uh, think across disciplines within the US government. Any institution mm -hmm. is built around certain competencies and capacities. If you think about what's needed to have an equitable response to global climate change, can WHO take the lead on that? Is it just a part of it? How, how, do, we, how do we have a global infrastructure that addresses mm. the health implications of climate change? Yeah, I think we still have to see the, some of the work that they are doing includes things like air pollution, right? I mean, it sounds very basic, but that is one area I know that they're focused on where they see is kind of meeting in that in that space. Um, in addition to the work that they're doing, um, looking at animal health versus human health, right? Um, as it relates to, to outbreaks that uh, are caused by that, that overlap. Um, but but no, I don't I don't think that they're the the sole actor. And in fact, they are part of a uh, a group of multilateral organizations that's looking at uh, One Health in particular, I think in recognition that they are not the, the sole actor that can contribute um, to this. So I, it, it'll be interesting to watch this space, um, how the various um, stakeholders can coordinate their efforts, um, how the resources come together too, right? Um, uh, and I'm not just talking about these sort of intergovernmental bodies, but even civil society actors, right? Um, community activists, advocates, and the private sector. You know, how often are some of these other groups also talking about this overlap and working in that, I guess, gray zone? Um, so we've got a question that I want to bring in, and I think it ties into your relatively recent entry into government. And there are all these offices, and you report to the secretary. You mentioned an office of climate change. You mentioned health equity, um, how, what's the interplay between an office like equity, which is looking mm -hmm. across policies with an emphasis on equity, an office like yours, which is looking at global across topics, how, how does that work? It works just fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's what I really enjoy uh, about where I am is I get to have a bird's eye view uh, of a lot of this work. Um, from AIDS to Zika, I sometimes like to say, right? We are truly covering the basis when it comes to global health, um, but we're not alone in that space, right? And so, um, as you mentioned, there are colleagues who are more squarely focused on equity. We actually have a, a, an equity advisor on my team who liaises um, with that office. And so that's typically how it comes together. We recognize um, 
the areas where we, we have that synergy um, and we ensure that we're, we're well connected in that regard. Um, but we, you know, in the Office of Global Affairs, really see ourselves as the Department of Health and Human Services chief diplomat, I guess. Um, you have uh, divisions of HHS like NIH, CDC, FDA, um, and uh, plenty of other divisions who have an international interest or even international arms and staff. Uh, but we help tie all of that work together and represent that work in the world. Um, we also are working with the world to bring those ideas back to those very institutions, right? And ensure that our work here at home is influenced and informed by the work that we see in some of those really great practices uh, demonstrated abroad. So that's kind of how it, how it comes together and whether we're focusing on COVID or focusing on disparities or focusing on, on, on climate and health, um, that's the exchange of information and ideas that takes place and that we try and broker. That was a very helpful explanation, thank you. Um, well, you mentioned One Health and you mentioned complex issues. Um, and I wanna ask about another One Health topic, which is antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we have a major uh, ticking time bomb in the world about the declining efficacy of existing antimicrobials, antibiotics. Um, various global entities and enterprises attempting to develop the next generation of antimicrobials. Um, but it's one of these sort of, uh, and, and, and the need for significant uh, antibiotic stewardship mm -hmm. around the globe. Um, it also has the interplay with animal health. Um, so this sounds like a perfect topic for you. It, it, it's multidimensional, it's global. It brings in, just within HHS, it would certainly bring in FDA and NIH and CDC, and uh, I would argue it brings in CMS as a payer, but it also brings in agriculture and others, other departments that you're not a part of. So how, how do we in the US government show leadership in an area that, again, is sort of easy to ignore on a day-to-day -day basis, but mm -hmm. has tremendous potential negative uh, uh, downstream uh, consequences if we don't address it? Um, how do we, I'll just start there. How do we lead the world to mm -hmm. address this issue that to many just seems too remote to understand? Well, the good news is we have been working mightily on this very issue, antimicrobial resistance. And I'm really glad you're lifting it up because these are the types of things that get um, sort of overshadowed by the moment we're in. Uh, but it's not lost on us that this is the this is a ticking time bomb of sorts, right? It's it's this sort of quiet fire. Um, underneath the, the current emergency and, and really sort of a silent pandemic. I know people have referred to, to it as. And so we have been investing in this, um, in this space uh, of antimicrobial resistance for some time as a government. So that should provide some assurance to your viewers <laughs> that we are trying to be on top of it. Um, some of the things that we have been doing include um, ensuring that um, there are incentives in place for new um, products to come to market, right? I mean, the, the, the issue is that there hasn't been as much innovation in antibiotics as there should have been um, before now, and not a lot of economic uh, uh, levers or drivers for that to take place. And so through HHS and through our um, uh, one of our agencies, BARDA, um, we've been able to work to kind of shift that uh, and, and bring more innovators and innovations um, into the space in a way that, that could be helpful. Hopefully that's a model for other countries and, and regions around the world to make similar investments because I think that'll be incredibly helpful. Um, to that point of working in partnership, uh, global partnership, um, we've also been engaging with groups like the G7 as recently as this year who did have antimicrobial resistance on, on their agenda as well, right? And so during these um, ministerial meetings with um, health secretaries like Secretary Becerra, they were able to talk about their renewed commitments in antimicrobial resistance and what could be put in place from an R&D perspective or otherwise uh, to ensure we're continuing to make progress. So it's, yeah, uh, I'm um, 
I welcome uh, additional partners uh, in this in this space that's going to remain important for us to focus on this issue. And really, because we don't don't want to <laughs> see um, something like that um, get get out of control uh, in its own right. And like you said earlier, we need to be learning real time um, what we can do to fend off any more disasters or emergencies in the health space. Um, so I love that focus on development of new antimicrobials. I want to just turn for a moment to the stewardship side. We have mm -hmm. both sort of health sector clinical stewardship, but we also globally uh, have this tremendous overuse of antibiotics in, in agriculture. Um, and so I wonder again, where does WHO, where does HHS mm -hmm. go in a topic? Uh, on the development side, you can see leadership from sort of medicine and medical and health and human services. But on the stewardship side, we really need environment and, and agriculture um, and food. So how do we bring, how do we make sure that the global response mm -hmm. on stewardship is yeah. as robust as it is on sort of working with the G7 on getting dollars into uh, drug development? No, it's a fair question and it's a bit outside my lane, but I think it's coming back to ensuring that the conversations we have truly are comprehensive and take all of um, sort of the full spectrum of solutions into account and making sure those stakeholders are at the table, right, um, as we're uh, uh, having those conversations. And so you come back to a group like the G7, which doesn't just have health ministers, right, but finance and other uh, ministers, I think that's where you see those joint um, solutions that are kind of looking at, I guess, supply and demand, or you know, again, um, all of the pieces of that puzzle. That's great. Okay, so I thought, you know, ten minutes into our conversation, I would turn to you and say, "And what do you want to talk about?" But everything you bring up, you make me want to ask you another question, and I still have more, but I'm looking at the clock. Tell me priorities that. You feel, I mean, you just had a, uh, I, I thought your, your comment a moment ago was really critical. You know, when COVID comes, everyone pays attention there and people lose sight of some of the other issues that have been uh, festering and, and, and need, need attention. They're just hard to, harder to attend to. Mm -hmm. So what are, what's the agenda of your office? What's the agenda mm -hmm. of HHS and the administration? Uh, that maybe isn't getting as much attention, isn't on my question list, because we tend to focus on what happened yesterday and the day before and not the problems that we've been trying to tackle for decades. Well, you touched on a lot of what we're focused on, so I'm not sure what that says about where we should both be, right? <laughs> but whether it's WHO or COVID, you know, those are very clearly on our list. And I appreciate that you were also sort of pushing in these other areas like equity and climate, right? Because I think especially given um, the way we've seen this pandemic play out, we can't forget about you know, those other pieces. It's not just about the, an active response, right? And, and even just sort of vaccinating our way out of a problem, so to speak, but really considering the, the various dimensions of it. Um, I suppose, you know, one piece that doesn't get as much attention, um, especially before now, but maybe will moving forward, is just this idea of, resilience, right? Um, and whether our public health systems are really designed to withstand any shock while still sustaining the good work that they're able to that they're able to do or the, the services that they're able to provide in a number of other areas. So whether we're talking about surveillance and data and you know, sort of information systems or the supply chain, or as I mentioned before, sort of the health workforce and particularly frontline health workers. There's a question for us as to how we re-examine those models, those mechanisms, um, not just for the moment, right? Um, but in ways that maybe were long overdue. I mean, we many countries around the world, and I would argue, you know, even ours, have needed to revisit the way we look at the healthcare workforce, um, especially the public health workforce, for some time. And, and it presents an opportunity now for us to really consider what we do from this point forward. You know, how do we recruit and remunerate these 
precious resources, um, let alone protect them so they, they're not burned out, right? Um, um, and they don't, they're not at greater risk. Um, so that we can provide better health worldwide. Um, and there's a similar question when it comes to where and how we, we manufacture key innovations. We can talk about R&D, but what happens along that pipeline, right? To ensure that perhaps that production is decentralized so that you know, if one line goes down, we don't sort of all suffer. Um, and even beyond that, once products are available, how they are distributed in an equitable fashion, right? How do we ensure that um, countries are, 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 have trained professionals on the ground, have the, the logistics and operational needs in place to absorb those innovations, to ensure that they can be utilized uh, in a way that's, that's needed, and so on and so forth. So that, you know, it's not, a, it's not the most exciting topic to talk about you know, the, the system, <laughs> you know, financial or, or, or sort of service oriented or otherwise, but I, I think we just, we need more people who are willing to come into this space with that kind of mindset and not only think about sort of the discrete problem and needs attached to that problem, but kind of how we build things out and even find these new connections you and I are discussing. So we're in a better place, a better position. Later. I think there are a lot of people very interested in uh, system resilience. So I think you'll find uh... Uh, uh, a ready audience. It's the solutions I think that, that we often yeah, with. that's true. You, know, you you raise two two different dimensions of resilience that I that I kind of want to spend a moment on maybe mm -hmm. each side of it. You began talking about uh, what I thought of where I thought you were going was more around workforce, and I will note one mm -hmm. of our uh, audience members asked a question about whether mm -hmm. uh, there are commitments or international support uh, around community health workers or crematoris. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have this very highly credentialed, highly trained and quite expensive workforce in the United States. Um, you, you go to less resource parts of the world and the supply of those highly trained uh, it, uh, healthcare workers is much smaller. And mm -hmm. if you want a resilient system, uh, you have to build it from the assets within the community because you're mm -hmm. never going to, to import enough uh, highly trained physicians and, and nurses to come in. So uh, that does seem like a form of resilience is to have systems built based on community workers, not on highly specialized uh, trainees. And I wondered if based on the questioner's uh, question, uh, sorry, that was redundant, but based on uh, the question about whether there's international support for that. And, and then you then got into, I think, sort of more like supply chain resilience, as in almost mm -hmm. redundancy. And that's certainly, we saw that with uh, PPE in, in the early days of COVID, where we just, I mean, people who just took as a given that you pressed a button and, and some uh, N95s would show up, and that just didn't work anymore. And now, of course, we're seeing it through the economy writ large. So I just wonder if you could mm -hmm. take sort of both sides of that, the human side and the the more, if you will, supply chain side. Yeah, I could, and maybe focus a bit more on, to your point of what, what we're trying to do about it. So on the supply chain side, we talked about this in the summit as well. We are, we've really got to figure that out. Um, I, I applaud the people in the administration who have been looking so closely at this too. Um, and I'm excited personally about some investments that the, the administration has been making to Kind of crack that nut. Um, our work uh, with uh, the sort of quad countries, uh, as we call them, India, um, Japan, and Australia, has been important in this regard uh, and, and investing particularly uh, in sort of uh, hubs or nodes um, on the Indian subcontinent has been critical uh, to thinking about how we kind of shift uh, or at least find another place in that region to scale these types of products, again, for, for today, but in ways that could, could help us in the long term. And similarly, uh, we've been able to, and this is not HHS, this is another part of the US government, the Development Finance Corporation, but um, we've been supporting their investments also in, in South Africa, as well as in, in, in Senegal. So you look at the, the African continent um, as another place where we could be scaling up this production and um, sort of thinking and looking differently at how do I suppose 
um, decentralize um, uh, the sort of production of, of, of supplies or other innovations um, today and, and perhaps tomorrow. And this is this is dovetailing with the U.S.'s stance on uh, the openness to a trips waiver or the um, the support for voluntary tech transfer. Why don't you explain a trip? Why don't you? Sorry, so, that waiver, just in, uh, in, yeah, I'll do my best. Okay. I'll do my best in lay terms. Um, but you know, there's a there's a real challenge, particularly in a in a health crisis, um, to ensure that countries have access to uh, intellectual property um, and know-how when it comes to producing life-saving innovations. And so there were proposals put forth um, in a sort of, in trade discussions and global trade discussions. And uh, the US didn't take a particular position on any of those proposals, but expressed an openness to um, the opportunity for countries uh, to be able to um, sort of receive that that know-how or or, um, or acquire that intellectual property, particularly around around COVID vaccines, which we thought was an important stance to take, given sort of what we're living through and given um, the, the limited access to those innovations, especially at that time. So that's a you know one way to be thinking about the the supply chain, and there there are plenty of others. I'm sure your audience members can can put forth. But coming back to the to the workforce issue, which is also just critically important, there there are so many ways to slice this too. And um, you know, I appreciate um, my colleagues at HHS looking at this um, from a domestic standpoint, largely, but in ways that have global implications. Um, and I guess I'll take I'll take an opportunity to to dig a little bit more into something that I know we've read and maybe even discussed among ourselves, but maybe doesn't come up often enough, which is kind of this intersection of mental health um, and healthcare workforce. So we've been just really thinking about how affected people on the front lines have been by this pandemic, but also just de in delivering care. You know, the work that they do is hard every day at baseline, let alone in a pandemic. What are we doing to care for our care providers, right? Uh, and how are we ensuring that there is some degree of renewal to that workforce um, so that we're not just trying to fill the pipeline with more people, which is important, but we're, you know, we can keep the people <laughs> in the pipeline that we have. Um, so that, you know, that's something I know our Surgeon General is thinking about along with our Assistant Secretary for Health and they've been having conversations with global partners, you know, who are asking similar questions, right? So coming back to, um, say, the government of India, but also um, colleagues in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, those are those are critically important questions that I think kind of fall by the wayside. It's not to say that it's not also important to talk, like I said, about recruitment or um, how uh, or, or paying our community health worker workers in particular. Um, and so I, I know that those are active conversations um, that the U.S. is participating in. Um, but we're also thinking about um, these other maybe less tangible uh, solutions to supporting that community. That's uh, it's so important and so multidimensional. And of course, the mental health strains go far beyond workforce and exactly. you know, workforce limitations for addressing mental health concerns. So Correct. You've got yeah. To talk, you've, got to talk a, you've got a thorny issue there. Yeah, no, of one, course. <laughs> I want to bring in one last substantive topic and then just ask a little bit about your own uh, experience. Sure. But I, I, I would be remiss if we ended the conversation today without noting the WHO's recent approval of the first vaccine for malaria. Yes. And uh, it it's really exciting. And uh, but it then raises the question, what's the role for the United States mm. in supporting distribution in layering this on top of all of the other demands, but uh, this is an area, of course, that uh, we've been working on for decades. And so to, to get to this point, it seems like an opportunity we can't pass by. What What's the early thinking out of uh, the office? Well, it's big news. It's big news for our National Institutes of Health, which had a big role in this, and um, along with other government um, agencies, and obviously international and, and, and non-governmental partners, um, and it's it's part of what we were talking about, right? Um, th this 
opportunity to ask these questions specific to COVID um, and maybe specific to COVID vaccines and say, well, what if, what if we had a, another vaccine? Um, and how do we ensure that there's, there's equitable distribution, that there's a clear procurement mechanism, that you know, we can ensure these are actually shots in arms. And here we are with, with this now, you know, this WHO recognition um, and the opportunity to sort of take these lessons learned, um, not just from COVID, but from, but from other immunization programs and apply them um, to this, this groundbreaking innovation. It's, it's very exciting, um, I think, for a lot of us. And, and um, you know, we were sort of waiting on this moment. Um, it also reminds us that we have to be able to walk and chew gum, as they say. So, you know, let's remember that malaria is still very much a global health emergency, even if we don't feel that as much in the U.S. It affects millions worldwide every every year, unfortunately. And so um, I think we want to, through various initiatives like the President's Malaria Initiative, which we, with which we have a partnership, we want to ensure we are moving as quickly as possible um, to take advantage of this kind of innovation. Uh, that's great, and I, I hope we are able to walk and chew gum at the same time here. Well, as we come down to our closing moments, um, I think I read that when you were in college and starting your studies, you were thinking of becoming a doctor. Is that a fact? I was, Did I read that yes. right? <laughs> and here you are, uh, not, not a clinician, but uh, moved into policy. And I, uh, as someone who's in uh, health policy without a clinical degree, I, I can, uh, I I can respect the importance of the clinical training, but also value what it means to be in policy. I wonder if you could say a little more about how you migrated in your own thinking about moving from more clinical orientation to a more policy mm -hmm. orientation, what that meant to you and what yeah. you feel like you left uh, behind, but what you feel like you gained in making that choice. Yeah. Uh, I seem to have worked my way out. So um, yeah, I definitely started thinking, okay, I'll help one person at a time. Um, I was, I'll be honest, I was rather intimidated by medicine ultimately. So I thought I'll leave that to the smart people and I'll, you know, move into other spaces. <laughs> and, um, and eventually uh, sort of found my way into community health and outreach, which felt very fulfilling for me. Um, I did a lot of that work where I'm from in Los Angeles, California, um, in settings that um, don't have a lot of resources. Um, and so um, it, it, it mattered to be able to reach people um, where, you know, a lot of times at the time, um, you know, they, they weren't getting uh, key information and services. Uh, and that, you know, blossomed or, or became my great passion for, for public health. And I took that overseas. Uh, and as I continue to do that work, and more importantly, work with people who were really sort of driving progress in that space, you know, whether that was in Thailand or Nigeria or Philippines or you know anywhere else, I found that we were all hitting the ceiling, and that ceiling had a lot to do with health policy. Uh, and so I sort of backed into this world that we're in. And um, uh, even though I've been living and working in Washington for a long time, um, somewhat reluctantly uh, accepted that I was more of a, of a policy person <laughs> than, I, than I initially let on. And I, you know, I don't have a, a degree in political science or law or, or, or other areas like many people in this town do. Um, but I truly enjoy it. And I'm really grateful that Grateful, first off, that I get to do this work every day um, with, with amazing colleagues, um, but also um, really proud that the way I approach the work, at least, is rooted in the people with whom I work shoulder to shoulder in California, in Abuja, in Johannesburg, right? I mean, that's what matters most to me is keeping those people in mind and understanding why I'm even contemplating this systems change that I am, you know, why I'm so concerned about the mechanisms and the ecosystem and, you know, the way it all comes together. It's not just an exercise in you know, how to, the, the next paper I'll author on this subject. Uh, it's, it's really about fundamentally 
changing the way we do business and ideally saving lives on their terms, right? Um, and, and reaching those people who particularly um, are historically marginalized and you know, don't have a seat at these tables, you know, don't have the microphone or platform that we do, um, but you know, ultimately need us working for them. Well, I won't ask you to preview your tell-all book since you're new in. But <laughs> since this is, I believe, your first stint in federal is. government. What are your early observations about moving from the uh, private sector and the nonprofit sector into this big monster called the United States federal government? <laughs> well, uh, thankfully, uh, there's there's still a good deal of idealism on this side of the fence. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm a bit of an optimist, and so I'm glad that that, um, you know, that hasn't waned uh, since I've arrived. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, to sort of spend so much of my career seeking the change now I, over which I have some degree of control, uh, and so I feel very responsible in this position, uh, and that seems sort of I don't know. Um, it seems like that would be a given, but I don't know if I fully uh, recognize the, you know, the the power and responsibility until um, I sort of sat in this chair. So I just I, I don't take it lightly. That's for sure. Um, I do um, still very much appreciate uh, sort of uh, everyone who continues the work and the fight um, outside government and have a, a, a deeper appreciation for the importance of that, of that pairing, I suppose. Um, it, it really is a, an important symbiotic relationship, uh, I think. So I, I, yeah, I am glad to be in and I will <laughs> um, stay as long as I can be helpful and effective, um, but certainly appreciate the experience. Well, Lois, it's been great talking to you. Uh, we've covered a tremendous amount of ground. It's a reminder of how broad the global health portfolio is, even just within the Department of Health and Human Services, much less other aspects of uh, global relationships. Uh, but you've given us great insight into what the issues are, what the key challenges are, and what your approach is. And I, I really couldn't ask for more. So, so grateful uh, to you for taking the time to talk to me and uh, share it with uh, so many of our, uh, our audience. Uh, to those of you in the audience, if you liked what you heard, uh, please go to healthfairs.org and sign up for future events um, and let people know that this event has been recorded. And as I said at the outset, it'll be posted within a few days. Uh, some upcoming events on uh, Thursday, October 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have a journal club going through a paper on uh, the Association Between Medicaid Expansion and Perinatal Mental Health on Tuesday, October 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We have a lunch and learn on uh, the uh, Health Affairs Equity Project uh, led by Dr. Vabren Watts, our equity director here at Health Affairs, and there will be more events coming uh, every opportunity we have to announce them. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, that brings us to the end of today's Policy Spotlight.